So um, you've done pretty well in your research, you've published a number of high impact papers, won the odd prize. Um, but you've also, in parallel, done a number of things which have quite radically reshaped the research landscape in Britain, but also in other parts of the world. So did you always have that dual motivation to do great research and to change the science landscape? Or did it come to you slowly? Or what's your thinking about that? I think it was guilt, actually. So I'm going to explain quite what I mean. I, I think my main motivation is to do research for as long as I've still got the marbles to do it, okay? And so marbles, you know, in the brain. And so I think that's my main motivation. But I've always felt that what I've, that, that, that we all actually have a very privileged position to most of us doing research to follow our own curiosity. Can you imagine a more privileged situation? I, I'm, Honestly, it's not always fully recognised um, what a privilege it is. And this is entirely inside my own conscience. Um, I, felt, I found that I was quite good at doing things and organising things. And I sort of felt, if I, do, if I pay back by doing that sort of stuff, then I can justify in my own head, just following my own curiosity, whatever it is and wherever it goes. It had nothing to do with whether people would fund me or not or anything like that. It was somehow um, feeling right in my head to justify just being supported to follow my own curiosity. And it turned out that I was quite good at it. And, and I also wanted to support other researchers. And what I tended to find that sometimes people who got into positions of influence were not always those that were very close to the coal face about how things were doing. And so that did emerge a bit later. I was still close to the coal face, so I thought I could still um, uh, support and protect them, uh, people, whereas sometimes people doing those sorts of jobs got too distant and, and perhaps listened too much to the wrong people. <laughs> Okay, um, I want you to tell me first about, uh, I don't know if this was your first big merger, uh, it was the first one I was aware of, when you um, were involved or decided to merge Britain's two major cancer research charities. So at the time they were the Imperial Cancer Research Fund and the Cancer Research Campaign, which I believe had split back in the eons of time because of some kind of disagreement. Uh, so you brought those two charities together to form Cancer Research UK. Um, why did you decide to do it? Um, how did you go about it? And how long did it take? Well, the first thing is you're right. There was once a single um, cancer charity, I think called the Imperial something or other. And um, that was founded about 1900, 1905. And they split because there was a row amongst the um, physicians, cancer physicians, about 1920, something like that, and it split into two. Now, why I was running the what was then nicely called the Imperial Cancer Research Fund. Um, goodness knows how long, why that survived long after we no longer had an empire in this country, but it did. So uh, let's call it ICRF, and then you can forget the Imperial bit and all the other baggage that goes with it. So I was running ICRF, and I had several reasons for because it was my idea and I did initiate it. The first was that um, there was a sort of scientific fit between the two because ICRF was mostly in-house with a major institute at Lincoln's Inn Fields and then Clare Hall. And in addition to that, um, the, with these various clinical units, whereas um, Cancer Research Campaign, which is the other organization, was actually mostly um, response mode out of house. And I think the strengths in both of those and uh, putting them together, I thought, had a scientific purpose. But the second and probably the bigger reason was that the two charities were going on what I thought was a very um, negative course, which was that they were competing for fundraising and there were tendencies in both of them to criticize the other one for what they were doing strategically and so on. And that could be only negative overall. 
um, because uh, you, you, if you have, if you're trying to persuade the public to support can, uh, cancer research, you need to have a broad base for that, from discovery research to totally clinical and, um, uh, uh, and public health uh, research. And having different charities sniping at each other was just very, very negative. So putting them together, I felt, would, re would remove that and I also thought that it would improve fundraising. And that was the big gamble, because 80%, because we did ask, thought that fundraising would go down. It, and it, I, I was only hoping that it be maintained or increased a bit, but actually increased dramatically as a consequence of that. So I think it was mainly the uh, trying to put two together so they wouldn't fight, to have a common strategy for cancer research. And it was complementary um, that sort of made me think that was the best thing to do. But how did you manage to persuade these two very distinct organisations that they should do it? Did you make them think it was their idea? or? <laughs> <laughs> well, there wasn't a lot of enthusiasm amongst, for it, amongst my colleagues, to be quite honest. I wouldn't say it was... I mean, it was particularly negative, but it certainly wasn't particularly positive. Uh, I did go and speak to the two boards. Um, they saw the point of having a single common entity, but they were very concerned that they would lose influence in the organization that came out. And in the end, I volun that volunteered. What made it actually eventually work, and I haven't actually ever said this in public, I, I think, was that I said I would resign after less than two years so that... Um, ICRF was bigger than CRC, there was more support for me to run it afterwards, but um, CRC at the time felt that they were being taken over. So I said I'd put it together and then resign, which is what I did. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question I want to ask you about is something I'm sure most people are not aware of, but when you were at, um, president of the Royal Society, um, you changed the arcane rules which determined how long scientists could be on the governing body, the council. Um, and this sounds like a really technical issue, but, but it was very important for women scientists because women were always hired to the one-year positions which were to provide breadth and coverage, whereas the men were doing like the serious, oh, this is the Royal Society stuff. And I remember when this would be raised by women, they'd say, oh, yeah, it's a shame, but it's too difficult because the Queen would have to agree. So how did you do that? <laughs> well, um, any rule change in the Royal Society when I went there, they said was always too difficult to <laughs> do. Because of the Queen. <laughs> and it just was rubbish, of course. Of course you could change it. They said it'd have to go to the Privy Council and so on. Now, we did have to go to the Privy Council over something. I've forgotten. Oh, no, no, that was the merger, actually. I think we had to go to the Privy Council over well, I wasn't the CRUK. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but with the Royal Society, that was less important. Now, you're completely right in what you said. I didn't think I actually ever said it like that. Cause it, did I actually say that's why I did it? I mean, the, because of the, that? Or I'm no. To, no, no, of course not. Good. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that is indeed a reason, and I'm glad you've seen through me with it. Um, what I felt was two things about the Royal Society Council. One is there were too few women and they all came in through the second thing and mm. that, that was only for one year and it was a nonsense rule anyway. The second was the geographical spread was poor and it was all Oxford and Cambridge. And that both of those I changed um, by various devices uh, some of which I didn't make explicit, of which one you've just referred to. And I think we, and, and in fact, we got ended up with a council, and I forget whether you were, I mean, which was nearly 50% women, despite the fact that there were um, only about 4% fellows. I mean, it got, it was utterly unbalanced in that yeah. respect. But it did change the way, in fa in fa in the way council was operating. Yeah. Um, the next question is one that will be of great interest to the audience, which is about uh, the... Uh, creation of the Crick. It's probably an understatement to say that there was a certain amount of opposition to this. Um, and I'm, I'm very interested to know, A, did you ever wake up in the middle of the night wondering if you were doing the right thing? And then now, do you feel vindicated? 
Well, it, it didn't have universal support um, from almost anyone, actually. I mean, it, it didn't from the... <laughs> apart from you, obviously. Apart from me, yes. <laughs> because the faculty, you know, people didn't want to move from um, Mill Hill and Clare Hall, and it was only lukewarm from Lincoln's Inn, because people don't like change, you know, the, you, you understand that. And change looked as if it was going to destroy what people liked and in, enjoyed. So there wasn't support there. Um, the other, uni other members of the research establishment, the universities and so on, didn't like it. Um, you may, people may remember that Mill Hill had been attacked for about a decade before with various reviews, and those were all... Um, I was on several of those and, 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 and did my best to defend an IMR, because in fact there was a lot of pressure just to get rid of it and get the money distributed around the country. I mean, that was a prime mover. Now, what I felt was that in the, a research um, endeavour, you need pluralism. You need different ways to deliver research. And having it all the same, I don't think is such a good way. I think you need diversity. And having in-house research, which is the sort that um, we, we do in Crick here, does offer um, some uh, differences from a response mode university way, which I'd also worked in, so I was familiar with both. The other thing, though, that made me think about it and that way was that you needed, if you were going to set up something like the Crick, um, it had to justify itself. It had to do something different from what was going on in the universities. And that, um, that needed correction of a problem that research institutes and units have, which is that they tend to get rather inward-looking, looking at w what they do for themselves rather than what they do for the endeavour. And I do think we have evidence of that, that that can happen. So I felt it was very important that we had an institution that saw itself as supporting the entire endeavour rather than just competing with universities. And th that's the uh, beginnings of the sort of pipeline approach of the six plus six, which would, uh, where you wouldn't hang on to people, but you would export them. Some, maybe um, a, a majority, maybe not, but some that would go to the university sector. Now, the universities took, haven't yet recognised all of that, but it is central, as you know, to how we are operating. The others that would leave and go internationally, incidentally, rather looking at EMBL, you end up with a network of connections across the, um, the, the world, which is another fantastic plus as well. So the whole thing is built on the six plus six, which makes it different from um, a, 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 nor a, a conventional institute and different from the, um, the university. So that was one thing that made me think that was right. The second is, um, is more subtle, but very, very important. Uh, I, I felt that what we wanted in an institute was to be in front of the curve, a term I want, that is looking for where the future may go. Um, and that is built always on youth, so that's back to the six plus six, with older people like me being able to provide support, guidance, and, 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 and the like. But the best approach for that, which I learned really watching what was happening when I was in the US, is that if you are big enough to be able to recruit on the best athlete approach, what I mean is instead of having to fill a particular position in a certain localization, then it's easier to get the highest quality. If you're in a university and you're in a department of immunology, you have to, have to hire immunologists to get the teaching and so on. And it may be the year you need them or the next, over a couple of years, there's no good ones out there. I mean, it's just, but you have to do it. If you have no agendas like that, if you can be essentially um, free of um, top-down agendas that we've got to... And this is where it, it, people... F Do you remember when I was attacked by the Lancet for having no strategy? I don't know if you remember that. Because I didn't say I was going to do stem cell research or um, anything else that happened to be popular at the time. What we do is, of course, search for the best people we can find in the world and let them set the agenda. And what that is, is a way of actually maintaining the very highest standards. Not everywhere can operate like that. I mean, it's that, but we can. So those two big differences, being outward looking and trying to support the endeavor, and secondly, being able to hire um, across the, uh, the, uh, all areas, because we were big enough to do it. Sorry, by merging all of these, we became big enough 
not to have to um, be confined to an area. Now, that's something I learned at Rockefeller, where we were also bigger, not quite as big as here in terms of group leaders. So you could just uh, advertise openly and get the best people, and it worked brilliantly in Rockefeller, and I wanted to, to do that here. So, if you th these are things that we didn't talk about quite so much so explicitly, but this leads to a different sort of way of viewing the Institute. Now, in addition to that, of course, because, I mean, one would like to think that this would convince people, but the reality is why it worked is simply because Mill Hill was, was falling down, really, not fit for purpose. Lincoln's, I mean, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but it certainly wasn't fit for purpose. Lincoln's Inn was 1950s and was actually quite well maintained, but still a uh, restricted footprint and not well designed. And um, Clare Hall was, you know, 1970s, 80s sort of, um, you know, journey job, a job that, you know, wasn't, you know, leak water and stuff all the time. So it was really worked because the organizations realized they had to do something about their three um, decaying infrastructures, and we provided an answer to it. 